Hello, everyone. The, thank you for joining both in person and virtually. I am Utsav Sadana. I am currently a postdoctoral researcher at McGill University. Uh, today, I will talk about uh, my research on differential games with impulse control. This is a meter Gerard researcher seminar. Some of you might know me, and many of you might not know me. So, I prepared. Uh, what happened? Okay, so, uh, and about me, um, let's talk about myself first. So I did my bachelor's in material science and engineering and my master's in economics from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in India. During my uh, undergraduate, I went for a research internship at OIT France, Paris. And during my, uh, I mean, I did my PhD in management science from, from HSA Montreal, where I was fortunate to work with George and Vishwa. And I also was fortunate to collaborate uh, with Professor Tamir Bashar. I went for a research internship at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, you can see my sweatshirt, it's bought from there. So, uh, and uh, I was also very fortunate to work with Eric during my PhD. Uh, and since June 2021, I am a postdoctoral researcher at McGill University, where I work with Eric from HEC Montreal, Professor uh, Mehmet Gumush from McGill University, and Angelos Giorgio, whom you are not able to see presently, here from the University of Cyprus. My research spans the fields of game theory, control theory, robust optimization, and machine learning. Today, I will talk about game theory and, in particular, uh, uh, application, uh, in particular, a field at the intersection of control theory and game theory, which we call as uh, differential games with impulse controls. Okay. Thank you. So the outline of the talk is as follows. First, I will talk about uh, real world applications of impulse controls. Then I will talk about a model that captures the strategic interactions that arise in many real world applications. I will also briefly talk about the literature, in particular focusing on the implications of state information on the Nash equilibrium that can arise in uh, many real world problems. Uh, most of the talk will focus on feedback Nash equilibrium. In particular, I will talk about sufficient conditions to characterize feedback Nash equilibria in differential games with impulse control. Uh, I will specialize the results to a linear quadratic game problem. And toward the end, I will talk about uh, some of the numerical examples and some future research directions that one can undertake in this area. Uh, uh, this talk would be mostly about how we, we derive, I mean, how we use these conditions that we derive in the, basically the sufficient conditions to solve a linear quadratic game problem. Uh, I would keep it at a very introductory level so that if you have any questions, I would be happy to take. I don't have a lot of slides here. So please jump in if you have any questions or comments. In many real world applications, some agents take actions continuously while other agents act intermittently. For instance, in pollution regulation, firms continuously make production decisions while governments intervene through regulations at certain discrete time instants. These regulations could be in the form of taxes or closure of factories at certain time instants. Another example is in hacking where a software firm continuously makes investments in security while, the, while hacking attempts are made only once in a while. Some other examples of discrete time interventions are inventory restocking decisions that are taken only at certain discrete time instants while uh, demand uh, is continuously evolving. Or basically the stock, the inventory stock is continuously evolving due to the demand. Other example is lockdown policy and so on and so forth. In all of these applications, a common theme is that some agents are strategically choosing the timing of their actions while other agents are continuously making decisions. In all of these applications, 
the objectives of the agents are interdependent meaning that the cost of one agent depends on the actions of the other agent firms emit pollutants which affect the consumers and uh, and therefore it affects the cost function of the firm that is concerned it affects the cost function of the government which is concerned about the consumer welfare another important feature of these game problems is that agents are making decisions over time so agents can condition their actions on the past moves of other agents in the system this is what leads to a dynamic or a differential game problem since some of the agents are making discrete time interventions we call this a differential game with impulse control let's look at a real world example of impulse control recently new delhi government shut down some of the factories to reduce the pollution levels this is an example of impulse control the question is when should the government shut down factories this problem of uh, determining when to shut down factories can be studied using impulse uh, differential games with impulse control firms are making continuous production decisions and at certain discrete time instants government intervenes and shuts down factories government wants to determine what are the optimal times and levels of interventions these interventions are costly for the firm because firm loses revenue if some of the factories are shut down so firm wants to determine how to optimally respond to these intervention decisions by the government clearly the intervention policy of the government depends on the production plan of the firm and firm's production plan depends on the intervention policy of the government this is what we call as a differential game with impulse control now i will abstract away from applications and talk about the mathematical model that can capture the strategic interactions that arise in the applications that i talked about we have a state we have a dynamical system that is evolving over time the state is represented by x this x affects the two agents differently you can see that if x increases player 1's cost decreases while player 2's cost increases so player 1 wants the state to be higher player 2 wants the state to be lower however the player 1 can continuously control the state so player 1 is continuously increasing the state value but at certain discrete time instants player 2 intervenes and brings the state to a lower value and then again the state evolves until player 2 again intervenes this interactions can be represented by a ordinary differential equation with jumps we have a state x that is being evolved continuously due to the action u of player 1 at all times except the impulse instance tau y at these impulse instance tau y player 2 intervenes and causes a jump to the state here tau y x tau y plus denotes the state value just after the impulse tau y x tau y minus denotes the state before the impulse instant x tau y plus minus x tau y minus gives the jump in the state and this jump is being controlled by the parameter psi i which is a control parameter for player 2 so player 2 uses impulse controls and these impulse controls consist of a sequence of tau y and psi i player 1 uses continuous control u to control the state trajectory now we can define the optimization problem of player 1 and player 2 player 1 chooses the control u to minimize the cost j1 player 2 uses the control impulse control b to minimize the cost j2 you can see here that the continuous control u of player 1 enters the objective function of player 2 similarly the impulse control of player 2 enters the objective function of player 
In addition to this, the state dynamics are being controlled by both player one and player two. So what we have here are two coupled optimization problems, which define a non-zero sum differential game with impulse control. A specific case of non-zero sum differential games is a minimax impulse control or a zero sum game, game where loss of one agent is equal to the gain of another agent. This is, a, this is just a specialization, but in our applications, we are mostly concerned with non-zero sum differential games with impulse control. Note here that objective function of player one has this running cost H1, which depends on the control of player one U. At certain discrete time instants, player two intervenes, resulting in cost C1 for player one. Similarly, player two incurs a running cost due to the action U of player one. And there's a cost of giving an impulse which is given by C2 for player two. S1 and S2 denote the terminal cost for both player one and player two, respectively. Until now, do you have any question? Yes, I have a question. This is Elias online. Yeah, Elias. Yeah, yeah my question is regarding the um, the zeta. Um, how often it it occurs, or how strong it is? How often? Uh, so it's uh, player two also determines the the number of impulses that player two wants to give. So it's a decision variable. It is, and is the magnitude of huh? Sorry. It is not it's random. It's not it's not an external effect. No, no. Here, uh, player two is choosing psi. I. It's a decision variable of player two. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. Is there any other question? Okay. Next, I will summarize the literature on differential games with impulse control. Uh, most of the literature is on zero-sum differential games. Uh, there are three papers which consider non-zero-sum differential games with both continuous and impulse controls. In these three papers, we show that uh, we, we provide uh, conditions to characterize the Nash equilibrium under different information structures. Recently, there have been uh, more work in impulse uh, in differential games where all agents use impulse controls only. There are no continuous controls, and uh, mostly in applications uh, in finance. These are these papers are considered mostly applications in finance. So now I will talk about these. Uh, I will briefly talk about all these three papers, and it and then I will uh, move forward. So in order to understand these. Uh, the information structure, first we need to define what is the strategy and what is the Nash equilibrium. I think many of you might know it, but still I should do it for complete uh, description of the problem. So we have a strategy pi. The strategy pi is the plan of action for the entire duration of the game. We say that pi one star, pi two star are the Nash equilibrium strategies of player one and player two respectively, if two conditions hold. For a given pi two star, pi one star minimizes the cost for player one. The second condition is for a given pi one star, pi two star minimizes the cost for player two. If these two conditions hold, we say that pi one star and pi two star are the Nash equilibrium strategies. Action of an agent at any time t is determined by the strategy of the agent. Given any given state information xm, pi tells the agent the strategy pi tells the agent what it, uh, what they should do at any time t. So clearly, the the strategies depend on the state information. And since the strategies depend on the state information, Nash equilibrium strategies, no, Nash equilibrium also depends on the state information that is available to the agents at any time t. Okay. The 
the simplest information structure that one can consider is a open loop information structure where the state is being measured at the initial time only and the strategies are functions of time and the initial state this is the simplest information structure we can enrich the information by considering a sample data information structure where the strategies are functions of time and the last measured state value here the state is being measured at discrete time instants we can further enrich the information structure we can further enrich the information by considering a feedback information structure where the state is being measured at all time instants during the game here the strategies are functions of time and the current state value these information structures have implications for the time consistency of the nash equilibrium as well as the solution methodology that is being used to solve these game problems first let's understand what is the time consistency suppose i compute the policy or the strategy at time t if this optimal strategy that i obtained at time t matches the optimal strategy that i computed at the initial time it means that the strategy is time consistent you can see here that both open loop and sample data strategies are not adapted to the state at all time instants so if the state deviates from the equilibrium path then these strategies may not be the equilibrium strategies of the game that starts at time t so these strategies are only weakly time consistent the feedback strategies are adapted to the state at all time instants therefore these strategies are strongly time consistent and in this talk i will focus only on feedback nash equilibrium uh, that we obtained in in our recent paper in transactions on automatic control to obtain open loop nash equilibrium strategies we use the maximum principle to obtain feedback nash equilibrium strategies we use dynamic programming to obtain the sample data nash equilibrium we need to use both uh, maximum principle and dynamic programming to understand the feedback nash equilibrium we need to understand what is the value function suppose i am at the current time t the value function tells the agent the best the agent can achieve by playing optimally from now to the end of the planning horizon so bj at time t comma x is the minimum cost to go for agent j from time t and state x to the time to the finite horizon which is capital t suppose i fix phi to star which is the equilibrium strategy of player 2 then v1 is the minimum cost to go for player 1 from by playing optimally from t to x similarly v2 gives the minimum cost to go for player 2 given the equilibrium strategy phi1 star in this paper we show that phi1 star and phi2 star are the feedback nash equilibrium strategies of the of player 1 and player 2 if two set of two sets of conditions are satisfied first player 1's value function satisfies the hamilton jacobi bellman equations with jump conditions on v1 second player 2's value function solves the quasi variational inequalities now i will explain to you what are quasi variational inequalities and the intuition for these sufficient conditions do you have any question until now the characterization of uh, nash equilibrium in this game in these differential games is intricately linked to the class of uh, policies that we consider first we need to understand what is uh, the what are the policies for player 2 and how they are linked to the quasi variational inequalities given player 1's equilibrium strategy we want to solve player 2's impulse control problem we assume that player 2 uses a threshold policy the threshold policy phi2 consists of determining a continuation set and an intervention function let's try to understand what is a continuation set 
as long as the state is in this set, continuation set, calligraphic C, player two doesn't give an impulse. The moment the state leaves this continuation set, player two gives an impulse. The moment the state hits the boundary of this continuation set, player two gives an impulse. And the size of the impulse is determined by this function zeta. So we have reduced the problem of finding the impulse times and the impulse levels to finding a continuation set and a zeta function. In our example that I showed you at the start of the talk, uh, government shuts down factories if pollution hits the boundary of the continuation set. And government, and we want to know what is the boundary of this continuation set. Next, I will explain to you how to obtain this continuation set. Suppose the value function is given to you. You know the best value that you can achieve from any t comma x. Clearly by giving an impulse, you cannot achieve a value greater than v2 because v2 is the best you can do at any t comma x. If the best you can do at any t comma x by giving an impulse is equal to v2, then you will give an impulse. If the minimum cost that you can achieve by giving an impulse is equal to v2, you will give an impulse. If the best you can do by giving an impulse is higher than v2, then you will not give an impulse. So the best you can do at any t comma x by giving an impulse is given by this rv2. Now r here is an intervention operator and rv2 is defined as follows. Suppose the impulse is eta. The cost of impulse is c2 x comma eta. If you give an impulse of psi eta, the state moves to x plus g. This is the size of the impulse that we uh, that we talked about at the start. So this is the size of the impulse, and we know that the best you can do from t comma x plus g is v two. So if you find an eta that minimizes this cost, you have find found the best you can do from t comma x. So this is what R v two is. If R v two is greater than v two, you will not give an impulse. If v two is equal to R v two, player two gives an impulse. So now we know how to characterize the continuation set. If v two is less than R v two, you don't give an impulse. Otherwise, you give an impulse. The next question is how to get value function because we can only characterize these continuation sets if we know what the value function is. In order to understand that, we need to understand what is the, what are the complementarity conditions in the quasi-variational inequalities. In the continuation region, there is no impulse. And we know from classical control that, okay, if there are no impulse, then hamilton jacobi bellman equation will hold in the continuation region. And this is the hamilton jacobi bellman equation in the continuation region for player two. Sorry, there's a problem here. It should be H2. Some mistake. Should be H2. Okay, so this is the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation for player two. Now, in the continuation region, this condition holds. The complementarity condition is as follows <coughs> this condition holds that is, player two's value function satisfies the HJB in the continuation region. Outside this continuation region, V2 is equal to RV2. And at least one of these two conditions must hold at all time and X pairs. This is what we, this, what, this is what is defined as a complementarity condition. If either of these two conditions must hold at all time and state values. In classical uh, control problem, in classical impulse control problems, the boundaries of this continuation set are being controlled only by player two. But here, both players control the boundaries of the continuation set, which is evolving over time. So these boundaries are evolving over time and both players can control these boundaries. These boundaries are in turn being determined by the value function of, uh, by the value functions, which in turn depend on the control of player one. So this is a highly coupled optimization problem that we need to solve. 
Do you have any question? Okay. Now let's look at the optimal control problem of player one. In the continuation set, player one's value function should, should, should satisfy the hamilton jacobi Bellman partial differential equation, which is given here. This is the Hamiltonian of player one. H1 is the running cost. This is the gradient of the value function with respect to X. And F is the derivative of the state with respect to time. The equilibrium strategy is obtained by minimizing the Hamiltonian function of player one. And the AJB equation for player one is given here. Now this AJB equation holds in the continuation region. In addition to this, at the impulse instance, player one, player one's value function experiences a jump due to the cost that is incurred to player two, player one uh, as a result of this intervention. So value function at time tau minus is equal to value function at tau time tau plus plus this cost. This is the intervention cost of player one due to the interventions by player two. So what we want to do here is we want to solve this coupled system of partial differential equations coupled with these inequality constraints. And these inequality constraints here are for all time and almost all x values. In addition to this, the quasi variational inequalities that are defined here depend on the strategy of player one. Similarly, player one's optimality conditions have uh, depend on the strategy of player two. So the, the complicated issue here is that we want to solve this, this system of uh, partial differential equations to characterize the Nash equilibrium of the game. Do you have any question? Sorry. Hello, what's up? Uh, Hi, I want to know, uh, you say that here that uh, the player that make the intervention is like a government of, uh, to, to, to impose a policy. And I, I wonder why you look for Nash equilibrium and not for the Stackelver one. Uh, okay. Um, it's just to, uh, I mean, I would say that uh, it's Stackelberg is even, I would be, I would say that it's even harder to obtain in these problems. Uh, so so we, there was no literature as such in this area. So what we tried to do was first see if we can have results in Nash equilibrium. I will talk about Stackelberg at the end of the talk. Like uh, the, the, these can be a good, good extensions for these problems. Not, uh, so, but we did not, uh, we did not look at it from application side as such. Yes, um, that, that, yeah. that I wanted. I want to, to say you perhaps to to find an an example and real example where it is more uh, combines it that uh, you must use a Nash equilibrium perhaps uh, not uh, a government a government yeah. and yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so so the one of the examples is by uh, in a paper by Bertrand. Uh, he uh, they consider. Uh, a uh, uh, counter terrorism problem the government decides uh, the time when it should disrupt the resources they are looking at it in a in a continuous control setting but uh, we have an application in our paper where the government is determining when it should disrupt the infrastructure of a terrorist organization and the terrorist organization is continuously investing in its infrastructure so that could be an example of a nash equilibrium game where uh, where some agents make decisions continuously and others are taking discrete interventions. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay. Is there any other question? Okay. So I can proceed. Now I, uh, okay, I have enough time. So now what I will do is I will, I will show you how to use these conditions to solve a, linear quadratic game problem. 
Now, linear quadratic game problems have been studied extensively in engineering, economics, management, science literature, uh, because we are able to get some analytical insights using uh, this class of game problems. And the here the, the model is as follows. The dynamics are assumed to be linear in state as well as the control. U is the control of player one. Psi i is, a, is the impulse control of player two. Not impulse control, I would say it's the impulse level parameter for player two. The jump in the impulse, the jump in the state is given by psi i. The objective functions of the agents are quadratic in the state. Here, you can think of player one's problem as a linear quadratic regulator type of problem where player one is inferring a cost if the state deviates from their target state value rho one. So you can see here that the cost of player one is quadratic in the error term xt minus rho one. Player one also incurs a quadratic cost due to the control ut. There is an additional cost h1 due to the actions of player two. And this is the terminal cost for player one. Similarly, player two incurs a quadratic cost in the state due to the, uh, due to, uh, or due to. So the player two incurs a a cost quadratic in the state if the state deviates from their own target state value rho two. Another additional cost is being incurred due to the action psi f of player two. And there is a terminal cost xt minus rho two whole square at the terminal time. Oh. Okay, so player one's cost is linear, player one's cost is increasing in the size of the impulse. You can think of it in this way that if uh, player two uh, gives a large impulse, then it leads to bigger disruption of resources for player one, and therefore player one's cost is increasing. H2 has this special structure that we took from a paper to derive some analytical results uh, so here, if the impulse is positive, the cost is capital C. This is the fixed cost that player one, player two is incurring due to the impulse. Since there are fixed costs, you cannot intervene at all instants of time during the game because you will incur an infinite cost. So that's why agent two intervenes at certain discrete time instants. If the impulse is negative, then player two incurs a cost capital D. The marginal cost for player one, player two is small c if the impulse is positive and is minus d if the impulse is negative. If the, the, the impulse is of size zero, the cost is minimum of c and d. Now I will introduce the assumptions that we use to get analytical solution for this game problem. We want to determine the continuation set, which is basically the boundaries of this set. Suppose the boundaries are L given by L1 T, L2 T. If the state is in L1 T to L2 T, you don't give an impulse. Next assumption is if the state is above L2 T, player two brings the state to beta T. If the state is below L1 T, player two brings the state to alpha T. So now we have reduced the, uh, the problem of computing impulse signs to finding four functions, L2, beta, alpha, and L1. If we know these functions, we know the, uh, then the equilibrium strategy of player two. Next assumption is on the form of the value function. As you would have seen, it's hard to solve, uh, to get analytical solutions for coupled system of PDEs. So the classical approach in these game problems is to assume a form for the value function and compute the Nash equilibrium strategies. 
in classical control especially in linear linear quadratic control problems you assume that the value function is quadratic in the state because your objective function is quadratic in the state and controls so here we say that if there is no impulse then we can assume make the similar assumption in like in the classical control that the value function is given by phi j and it is quadratic in the state if the state is in the continuation set if the state is not in the continuation set we have to understand something if the state is suppose below l1 suppose the state is here so the player 1 player 2 will bring the state to alpha t the size of the impulse is alpha minus x we know that the cost is linear so player 2 will incur a cost cj alpha t minus xt now player 2 has brought the state to the continuation set and i know what is the value function in the continuation set which is phi j so we know what is the best you can do from alpha t it's phi j similarly if the state is above l2 what player 2 will do is player 2 will bring the state to beta b the size of the impulse uh, is beta t minus x and once the state is in the continuation set we know the value function which is phi j so our objective here is to find what is p1 p2 q1 q2 n1 n2 if we have found these functions we know the value function and if we know the value function we should be able to characterize the strategies of the players here we assume that p no, pj and qj are continuous and differentiable and n2 is continuous and differentiable in the continuation set player one's value function satisfies the hamilton jacobi bellman equation so we know we also know that value function is equal to phi 1 v1 is equal to phi 1 in the continuation set what we can do is we can plug in the quadratic form of phi 1 in this object in this uh, equation and we will obtain a system of differential equations this is this is known as a riccati system of equations you can see that this is non linear in p1 you can also see that q1 depends on p1 next we look at the uh, optimal con uh, impulse control problem of player 2 player 2's value function also satisfies the hamilton jacobi bellman equation in the continuation set so v2 is equal to phi 2 in the continuation set we substitute the quadratic form of phi 2 we will get a system of differential equations you can see here that q2 depends on q1 and q1 depends on p1 so this is again a coupled system that is arising because it's a game problem in a classical control problem you will not see uh, uh classical impulse control problem you will not see these kind of dependencies because there is only one agent and this leads to some complications if you consider a more general setup uh, here we have assumed certain um, structure on the problem okay until now is there any question okay so in the intervention region we know that v2 is equal to rv2 this is what i showed you earlier rv2 is basically you minimize the sum of these two terms and you can get rv2 we also know that if player 2 gives an impulse it brings the state to the continuation set suppose y is equal to xt plus n and y is in the continuation set we want to find it optimal eta what we can do is we can use first order conditions take the derivatives and we will get these two equations here we also know that the player 2 brings the state to alpha uh, to either alpha or beta and they both are in the continuation set so we can assume v2 is equal to phi 2 we can again plug in the form of the quadratic function quadratic form of phi 2 to get alpha and beta you can see here that alpha and beta depend on q2 and this q2 also depends on q1 and basically the actions of player 1 so 
So the boundaries of the continuation set here, uh, the size of the impulse is being controlled by player one as well, not just by player two. Okay, so now we want to characterize what is L1 and what is L2, because we have, we know now what is alpha and beta. So we now need to know what is L1 and L2. In the intervention region, V2 is equal to RV2. So we get these two conditions, depending on where the state is. If the state is below L1, player two will bring the state to alpha. If the state is above L2, player two will bring the state to beta. If X is equal to L1 and or, so for X is equal to L1, we get this condition. For X is equal to L2, we arrive at this equation. We can solve this system of equations for uh, assuming this quadratic form of phi2 to obtain what is L1 and L2. So now we know analytic, uh, semi-analytically what is L1 and L2. Here L1 and L2 depend on the cost of impulse as well as Q2 which is being controlled by, again, player one, as well as player two. To summarize, we have obtained semi-analytical semi characterization of feedback Nash equilibrium strategies of player one and player two. Player one's feedback strategy is linear in the state, which we also know from classical control. Here you can see that the strategy is linear in the state. However, here, if the state jumps because of the impulse, the control will experience a discontinuity. Similarly, the equilibrium state trajectory, sorry, the equilibrium state feedback strategy of player two involves knowing L1, L2, alpha, and beta, which we have obtained analytically. Now, the important issue here is that these are equilibrium strategies only if V1 is the, V2 is the value function. And V2 is the value function if it satisfies the quasi-variational inequalities. So now we need to verify whether the value function of player two satisfies the QVIs or not. V2 is the value function of player two if L1 is less than or equal to X11 T and L2 is greater than or equal to X22 T. Here X11 at time T depends on theta alpha, which in turn depends on the gradient of phi 2 with respect to t. So we have to satisfy all these conditions at all time instants to ensure that v2 is indeed the value function of the game, of the of player 2, sorry. v2 is the value function of player 2. Once we verify all these conditions, we can conclude that uh, the strategies that I showed you earlier are the equilibrium strategies of the game. Do you have any questions? Okay, so uh, now I, I show you some numerical examples that we did for different problem parameters. Suppose the state is 15. You can see that the state is above L2. So player two will give an impulse and bring the state to beta at time zero. Now, the state evolves over time and it remains within L1 and L2. So player two doesn't give an impulse. So there's only one impulse here. If the state is at zero, you can see that player two will give an impulse to bring the state to beta and then the state evolves continuously over time. You can also see here that uh, state here, state at time t equal to zero is um, is within, within in, is in the continuation set and throughout the time horizon, uh, the state remains in the continuation set. So there are no impulses in this game problem. So it depends on, uh, on the problem parameters, whether there will be an impulse or not. And also on the initial state values. Here, you can see that the value function of player one I have plotted the value function of player one and player two as a function of the initial state values. Player one's value function is continuous because of certain regularity assumptions that we made on the value function of player two, while player one's value function experiences jumps at the impulse instant. 
So here you can see that value function is discontinuous in the state, initial state. Let's look at another example. Here I change the problem parameters, and now you can see that player two gives an impulse if the state is at 20, not 20, I would say it's maybe around 18, and brings the state to beta t, beta at time t equal to zero, then the state evolves continuously until it hits the boundary. Once the state hits the boundary, player two gives an impulse, and then player one continuously controls the state. Here you can have three impulses also. The initial state is here. You bring the state to alpha t. The state evolves until it hits the boundary. And then again, the state hits the boundary here around point t equal to point a2. And we have an impulse. So here we have three impulses. It depends on what is the problem parameter that we have considered. Now I will talk about the future research directions that one can consider in this area. Uh, some of them are quite challenging, but I think uh, uh, one can study some of these problems using uh, the theory that is being developed over time. First problem is to consider deterministic uh, stochastic dynamics. Here I've considered that the dynamics are deterministic. You know the evolution of the state. Uh, one can consider that the dynamics are being controlled, governed by a, sto uh, by a stochastic process, or one can consider a stochastic differential equation, and now one agent is continuously controlling the, uh, the drift of, uh, of the SDE, and other agent is making impulses at discrete time instant. And one can study what are the uh, feedback Nash equilibrium strategies for this game. Another problem is to consider a Stackelberg main field games. You have a leader who wants to coordinate the actions of the followers. The followers uh, want, uh, are only concerned about their own objective, while the leader is concerned about, uh, suppose, uh, the, uh, the welfare of the population. Now, the thing is, Leader chooses an impulse control. Followers are choosing continuous control. The followers are playing a Nash game among themselves while the leader is playing uh, a Stackelberg game with the followers. This is a pretty hard problem in my opinion. Um, another issue is to consider, is to derive probably convergent algorithms to solve uh, this coupled system of quasi-variational inequalities. One can try to work on uh, policy iteration algorithms, which can compute the, the Nash equilibrium strategies of the game. So I, in the literature, there are no algorithms to, to, to solve differential game problems with impulse controls. Another issue is to consider that the value function is not everywhere differentiable. Here I assume that the value function is regular, but if we are looking for uh, non-differentiable value functions, we need to look at viscosity solution approach to solve these problems. I think Mabel has worked on some viscosity solution approaches for classical differential game problems. I think probably those kind of approaches could be used to solve quasi-variational inequalities as well. Another issue is to consider a minimax impulse control problem where the agent, that is the impulse controller, is risk averse and doesn't know the model for some of the problem parameters, and therefore uses a minimax impulse control approach to solve these problems. Some applications <coughs> of impulse controls could be in capacity expansion, where the price of a stock is evolving over time, and you are uh, you want to determine when you should invest in expanding your capacity. So there are multiple agents, there are multiple firms who, who are trying to, uh, who want to determine when to expand their capacity. They are seeing the evolution of the stock price and they want to determine the timing and the amount of, amount by which the capacity should be expanded. So basically the size of the facility that you want to build or uh, there can be other possible uh, descriptions of the problem. 
Cycle bar mean field games uh, have applications in pollution regulation in epidem and epidemic control. In pollution regulation, a regulator wants to determine uh, the time and the level by which the new regulation should be introduced, and the firms are determining their production to maximize their profits. Other example is in epidemic control, where government enforces lockdowns at certain discrete time instants, and the population uh, is choosing their social op optimal social distancing behavior to maximize their utility. So these are all the kind, all the problems that one can study uh, using. Uh, differential games with impulse control. So now I would uh, conclude here and I'm, uh, thank you for your attention. I would be happy to take questions.